Hey, good morning, y'all. It is uh, 7 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, the 8th of September, and hope you guys had a great Labor Day yesterday. We did um, just relaxing and hanging out with family. It was just a really fun, my hair looks kind of weird this morning. Got some weird things happening, but um, hope you had a great Labor Day. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, we'll jump into Romans 3. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Lord, thank you for uh, the way that you made for each of us through the cross. Lord, I just want to lift up our families and uh, all. We've got a lot of kids, Lord, starting school today and uh, teachers and uh, families and administrators and, and uh, Lord, anybody out there that's struggling with the, the, uh, the coronavirus or any other sickness, Lord, we just want to lift them up to you, Lord, the lost, the people that we know that that um, that desperately need you as their Savior, Lord, we want to lift them up to you this morning, and we just we just want to pray for a, a revival in our country. We we are so in desperate need of that, and so Lord, we know that that begins with a um, a fear of you and um, an awareness of who you are and our need a desperate need for you. Lord, we love you, and we ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so good morning, Bill and Vicki. There's my mom, my sister. So yeah, there's Ken Amon. Linda Boggs is here. All right, let's go ahead and I'm gonna turn the camera around. Let's look at, let's look at uh, Romans three. Okay, so Paul starts in verse one. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our right unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if through my life, for my, but if through my lie, the truth of God abounded to His glory, why am I also being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported in some claim that we say, "Let us do evil that good may come"? Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. Turn the page. <clears throat> there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he will be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. 
For is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So Paul, in these first half a dozen chapters or so of the book of Romans, is making the case for the universality of sin. That we as, believe, that we as believers, all of us, regardless of, of who we are um, in terms of where we come from, uh, whether we're Jewish or Gentile or whatever, all of us came to Jesus the same way, okay? And so Paul starts out in the first, just a few things out the door. Um, he spends the first few, and it's, it's interesting too, Paul uses a, a teaching technique here that is almost like a Q&A. He asks a question, he answers the question. He's done this repeatedly now through the first three chapters. And it's kind of neat, I was reading a commentary yesterday, he was talking about, this particular commentator was, was John Stott, was talking about that uh, perhaps this is uh, not really an imaginary person at all, but Paul, the old Paul, the persecutor, asking questions of the new Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And it's, it's kind of cool to think about because, you know, we still have the old us is still in our bodies, the flesh. We still struggle as believers with the flesh. But he's just, Paul is wrestling through out loud. He's kind of thinking out loud these questions about sin, these questions about who is justified. And he says, you know, are, do, do the Jews have an advantage? When, and the Jews are God's chosen people. We know that through the, the covenant that Abraham um, that God established with Abraham a long, long time ago. But uh, Jewish folks uh, still, if they want to come to a place where they are going to be redeemed, they have to come the same way through the blood of Jesus. And so, but the Jews were given a great responsibility, okay? And so it's important here because there were, you know, the idea of circumcision, they were still kind of holding on to that as being, hey, that was the, that was the outward, that was the outward show of, of, of that covenant, but yet at the same time, um, those are those are outward things. Those are outward things that don't that don't really. Paul, Paul is saying those don't really um, those don't justify. You, okay, and so it's kind of cool as as he goes on. He he starts quoting the the new. He starts quoting the Old Testament in verse ten. So he's going to run verses ten through eighteen, talking about. There is none righteous, not even one. So he's pulling out of the Old Testament words to remind his, his, not just his Jewish audience, but his Gentile audience that all of us fall equally under the penalty of sin. Uh, it says there's none who understands. You know, the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were blind. So it's one of the things that, you know, when you are in sin, you don't even realize that you need saving. You know, um, and if we, even if we make it about ourselves to say, you know, I chose God, right? That even then we are, uh, we are saying that, that, that God did not save us, but we chose him. God pursues you. God comes after you as a believer. Um, and so it says, there's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. So all, all means all, right? So it's very universal in that approach. But it's kind of cool. We're gonna we're gonna roll down here. So he's establishing that universality of sin. Look down in verses because verse twenty one. I love verse twenty one because all of those first twenty verses, he's making the case that we are all under the penalty of sin. But yet in verse twenty one, it flips, it pivots with a really cool word. But okay, verse twenty one. But because anything coming after that is talking about the cross, the solution, the gospel, Jesus on the cross. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law, by the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill the law, okay? Um, not to replace it, not to undo it, but to fulfill it. Jesus was the embodiment, what the law was, could have been or should have been but to say, hey, here I am. So he didn't come to contradict the law. He came to say, 
because if he contradicts, then we have an issue. But he did not. He came to fulfill the law. So, verse 23, one of the most powerful verses in all of Scripture is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because really, in order to be saved and experience the salvation that only Christ can give, we have to understand and come to a place where we realize that we need a Savior. And so, as you're leading, you know, if you, as you share your faith, as you do that, um, that's a wonderful verse to start with because the Bible speaks for itself. You don't have to add anything to that or take anything away from that. So, he rolls in, it says, I love this, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is a free gift. It doesn't come, you know, we don't have to pay for it. Jesus has already paid for it on the cross. And if you think about the cross, I would just encourage you that as you find time uh, in your daily walk, meditate on the cross. Think about what happened on the cross. Jesus, because the sin debt had to be paid. And so God unleashed his wrath on himself. Isn't that a crazy thing to think about? Because Jesus was God. And so as Jesus hung on the cross, God was literally giving all sin, all wrath on himself in the form of Jesus because he loved God and he loved people. And uh, it's really cool to think about. You know, what did Jesus say? There's two, there's two commandments that are the greatest, right? Love, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. When Jesus was on the cross, that's what he was doing. He was showing how much he loved God by being that sacrifice. But at the same time, he was loving people by allowing himself to go through that. Uh, verse 25 has a kind of a, a churchy word that we use a lot. It's a very, very powerful picture of, uh, of it's called propitiation, which means an atoning substitute. So Jesus bore the weight of sin, bore the penalty in our place. So because of the work of Jesus on the cross, his righteousness, his righteousness is imputed or given or credited to us. Not because we're perfect, we're far from it, but because he, when God sees us now as believers, he sees his son, okay? Um, and then lastly, one, one more thing. Uh, verse 27, where then is boasting? Oh, and I love this too, but one more thing real quick. He, he goes back here to say in verse seven and eight, he says, uh, because there was this, there was this sort of, um, there was this um, thing that kind of floated around that, hey, since I'm under grace, I can sin freely. I can do what I want. I've got my, you know, get out of hell free card, and I, I don't need. But he says, and why not say? He says, let us do evil that good may may come. That's not the way to do it, right? Being a Christian does not give us a license to sin. It averts us away from sin. So imp important to remember. Last thing, and then we're going to be go then, then we're going to go. He says, "Where then is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law or works? No, but by the law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law." Verses twenty-seven and twenty-eight. There, when you think of the gospel and meditate on the work of Jesus on the cross, there is no room for boasting on our part. Okay, we can't. You know, Paul himself said, "The only thing I have to brag about is Jesus and Him crucified. That's all I have." So we can't, it's not about us. It's not about anything that we can do or bring to the table. Jesus did it all for us, okay? I love you all so much. Have a great Tuesday. I hope it's a good one. Tomorrow we're going to be in Romans 4. Looking forward to that. We start talking about Abraham, and uh, it's going to be really, it's going to be really awesome. Let's have a word of prayer. Good morning, everybody. There's Burley and Angela and Laureen and Dr. Pruitt, Sandy Shepherd, Adam Farmer. Good morning to everybody. I love you all. Thank you all for hanging out with us this morning. That's Barry Hubbard. And uh, there's just one way. His name is Jesus. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, your faithfulness to us in spite of our own wavering and unfaithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for pursuing us, for coming after us. And Lord, we're just, um, we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Have an awesome, good Tuesday. Make it a good one. Love you all. See you tomorrow.